Ooh, hello there. Welcome to Real Love Guitars and we have another Yamaha Pacifica uh, 112, 112, 112 um, in natural and very popular guitars these. Um, Strat style, uh, straightforward, um, different tonally to a Strat a little bit and different in feel to a Strat but a very good basic guitar lots of room for modifications and upgrading and so on. Um, I'm going to do is I'm going to... Did I do a video? I think I already... Oh, I'm losing track of what I've recorded. I think I've already done a close-up of this so I won't do close-ups. I'll, in, I'll inter, insert them here. Um, I would have done that in the house, wouldn't I? <laughs> anyway, so look, what we've got is guitar in for setup and Gary wants us to play as well as it can. The first thing I, I noticed, and you might have seen on the close-ups if I did them, is uh, the weird uh, phenomenon of fret fill, end fill sprout, which is a really weird thing. Um, when, the, when the fingerboard dries or the whole neck dries and it shrinks a little bit, sometimes what you'll get is uh, the neck shrinks and of course the metal can't and so the frets stay the same size and you get what's called fret sprout and you, it doesn't have to be a hardly any for the fingers to feel it so it's very fingers are very uh, sensitive to that change and so um, over the years the thing dries out a little bit and suddenly the frets suddenly feel sharp where they weren't before now in this case we have a little bit of that but actually what's more noticeable is the uh, the end fill sprout so uh, the end fill has stuck out the little bit where the, um, the little the slot has been filled has actually stayed in place or maybe st stuck to the end of the, the fret tang. And as the neck has shrunk, the, actually the, the fill goo itself, the filler goo, has stuck out. Um, it's a bit of glue or whatever they used. That is probably pushed out with the tang, so if we just clear the glue away, the, you find the metal tang is sticking out with it. But you can really feel it on this, so we want to um, sand that back and take that away. Um, <clears throat> so this is going to be an overall setup, followed, well, including, um, I think, setting the tremolo floating. We're missing some pick guard screws on the back here so I'm going to take those the remainder off. Let's um, see if we can put you down to look down at that. Whoa, hey. Ooh, we've got, I forgot we've got this extendable thing which is really weird. It's, uh, it's not very, well it's kind of weird. I'm going to sneeze. Bit, bin it, catch it, bag it, whatever. No I'm not going to sneeze. <laughs> that wasn't very good. Um, yes, yeah, so I've immediately forgotten exactly what uh, we talked about in the setup, but I'm pretty certain that it was fairly straightforward. But I'll double double back and check before I do any more. <coughs> um, now, the question is: uh, I think I'm pretty certain that we agreed that we'd set this in floating mode. Um, and for that to happen, <coughs> I had to find a tremolo arm from my now quite limited <coughs> set of supply, supplies, supplies. So, uh, who knows? Let's see what we can find. Too big. Mm. Bet they're going to go ahead and make it uh, ultra small. Yes, that's very clever. The Yamaha. Look at this. I think I've got three. Three and that's your lot. Okay, well, I've got one here that will slot in, and gee whiz, that's, that's under massive load. Um, if this one didn't have, it works, but it's not ideal. Um, I don't think I have any more, so we won't find we won't find a working arm for this one. Other than uh, I don't think I've got any more. There's usually some kicking about here. Sometimes I end up cutting them up for use in other things. So these are all Squire style, um, and they are just simply a bit, bit bigger. Um, so the only way to convert one of those would be to re-tap it or re-thread it, if you get what I mean, to fit. But I don't know what the size would be for this. Um, okay. I'll go and have a look. Um, so we may, if I, I mean, I could. The thing is, I could set it up with this on it. The problem is, is it's not a working arm for this 
thing, so it wouldn't really be very practical. Um, I'll have a look around for any more, but I really think I'm out of arms, tremolo arms, tremolo bridges, trem bridges, telecaster bridges, no. Well, wrap around, two pneumatic wrap around. No, I think I may be out. Well, if so, it's going to end up being a, uh, I've got to be a flat, a uh, hard tail. Um, okay, so a fairly straightforward setup. I'm going to go away for a minute, check my emails, and then we'll go from there. Shouldn't be uh, that difficult, this one. Okay, so I've had a chance to look back at the emails, and um, we had agreed that this was going to be tremolo down only, so I can set that anyway. Um, which is fine. So that will be set like that, even though at the moment we don't have the right tremolo for it. Um, it won't look any different, but we'll just be able to test its downward pull. Now at this point in time, it is, it's got very heavy on the springing, so we'll take some of these springs off and we'll only put on as much as is required to keep it flat. And then um, if Gary finds a decent arm, or if he wants to, I can include this, you can use this one and just have some fun playing with it because um, this isn't going to get used on anything. Um, it would be nice if I could just thin that down as well. Maybe I'll, I'll try it on my tap and die set. Who knows? Anyway, um, the reason we agreed on this is that with it set flat like this and down with movement down only, it doesn't make any difference later on if he um, wants to uh, lock it down completely, uh, it won't change the action. If we had it set floating and he wanted to then lock it down, that does have an impact on the action, it changes it later on, which makes it a pain and he has to, he would have to um, change the action on all the saddles individually. I've, do, because of the, um, having worked out uh, how to set these things floating, I've also worked out the change in action on a typical setup that I do happens to be 0.5 mil across all of these so it's actually quite easy and that also happens to turn, turn out to be a single 360 turn of the hex key so it's actually easier to do than it sounds if you set it flat back once it's been already um, fully floating. Um, the thing I'm looking at first of all on this is that first of all there's a couple of things I know first of all I know it's got a there you go can you hear that it's got a, a nick in the uh, in the fingerboard up here. I guess it's this one. Uh, yeah, it's this one, the um, sixth fret. Um, so uh, I, I made a mention of that on the Real Love Guitars site, and some people uh, asked whether or not um, that was fixable by means of uh, by means of solder um, and I kind of have heard of people say that before um, but I've never really looked into it and my first instinct would be that's not going to be a good option because solder is very soft um, so I couldn't really see that surviving long enough to be a good repair and to fair enough I've done a I've done a bit of research on that and fair enough it's it's quite right that it's too soft and if you think about it you know it's too soft because when you press the soldering, soldering iron to the fret, it doesn't melt, does it? So, not a not a great way to do it. Um, so I don't think we're going to end up doing that. I'm just looking at this. This is barely down to my target action with these things flat on the deck. Um, but rather than put a shim in this neck, I'm going to work with that. So it means what I probably will try and do is find some shorter grub screws for these end ones because they're right on the deck and. It's horrible having these things sticking out of your hands. I may have, in all my various spare parts, I may, may have some. So um, we've got a couple of things to do. I'm going to, uh, we've got some wear down here as well on these lower frets, um, but it's the chip here that's the annoying part. And um, so there isn't a real feasible way of soldering that fixed. So I am going to um, level this these frets to get rid of it. They've been leveled before by the looks of this. Somebody's had a go in a couple of places, but um, we also the bonus is in doing so, we'll get rid of this play wear down here at the, at the low fret. Um, I'm gonna clean up the fret ends, which are sharp, and get rid of this sprout, which should ho hopefully stabilize everything. And I think I probably recommended to Gary that we replace this string tree with uh, a tusk one. Um, 
which uh, sort of adds a, a five pounds to the cost. Now I've got one kicking around. Uh, where did they go? I thought I had another two. I've got some here, but uh, the, well, the hardware is black at the moment, so hmm, I've got a white string tree, but then the pit guard's white, so I'll go with white. Anyway, so I'll bring that out with its little screw. Um, I don't like metal ones, it's as simple as that, not round, not nothing. Um, they just, they add drag, and if you want the guitar to play and stay in tune, the last thing you need is resistance. So I'm going to go on the basis that if we can use this existing nut, I'm going to. It's hard plastic, it's they're kind of specially made for the Yamaha, so it, they're, they're, they're quite tall and thin, so rather than start with one in my kit, and um, try and customize it. Go with the inked broke, don't fix it principle. So here we have, um, I'm just going to test the electrics too. So here we have a, a good, decent quality um, Pacifica. And um, what I'm going to just test is make sure that the uh, Oh yeah, the strap there. Ah, oh, I forgot the um, I forgot the jack socket on that one. Oh, I'll have to go back in time. But the jack socket on this one's wobbly. So the first thing I'm going to do is correct that before I go any further. Um, I'm going to use my special Stumac tool for this purpose. And that tool's quite good. Um, it would be great if I could show you me doing this for a change. So I'm going to get my bizarrely configured magic eye which is sort of oh my lord it's run out of not run out of flexibility just about let's have a look downwards clamp it shut oh, hey it's it's so extended out now this is trying to break the bracket that it's on but look we can look downwards so when you've got a, a loose thingy what you do is you let's turn around here so that we don't have to fall off the end put this in and we turn this backwards to lock the uh, hold on to, sorry, it's the other way, isn't it? No, backwards, turn it backwards to lock it onto the jack socket, and then we line this up to the right size. And then the idea is we will use the adjustable spanner to just tighten this up. And the good thing is that this uh, this device, the Stumac tool, will hold this in place nicely while I tighten that up and we get a good, um, really good tight fit. And that's nice and tight, and then you basically just gently turn this, loosen it off, and away it comes. So that's fixed that. Now it may be broken inside or something, we don't know that yet, but just for uh, wobbly factor, we've taken care of it. So first thing I'm going to do, oh, look at this, all these new camera angles. Just going to plug this in or the wind blows outside. Those of you who like to listen in to sounds of our lovely countryside, we are, ooh, we are, we are in a sort of, well, we're in February still, so it's not even wet, blustery March. is that that neck pickup's a bit, a bit underpowered for my liking but again uh, it's a personal preference thing so I'm just going to bring it up for now and then um, if it's not to Gary's taste then he can lower it later and actually what we've got is an overpowered humbucker because it's currently right up next to the strings so I'm going to slack that off a fair way just so we've got a bit of a better balance really um. Um, 
Also the test of uh, these strings is let's see what happens when we tug them. These are very old strings, but if this puts this well out of tune, it's, um, it will be a reminder of the importance of... That's what usually happens, thoroughly stretching your strings. So there's still some slack in there. After all these years, still going out of tune. Right now, I'm in a conundrum. Uh, I'll have to nick one of these now. The B string off of here, as they say. Um, which was a shame, because that was a nice complete set of sacrificial strings waiting around for the perfect day. But the perfect day has arrived because I've just broken one. Anyway, um, so yeah, there's a, there's some, some, uh, what do you call it? Still some stretch in there needing, getting rid of. Um, so when we come to restring, <coughs> excuse me, when we come to restring, one of the things I'm going to make very sure of is to get this um, stretched out properly so that it will play and stay in tune because that's really what you're after. So just uh, just for fun, I'll just show you what I do here. If you have a, an old string and you want to use it as a what I call a sacrificial string, um, and you, you're not going to get that coiled piece of string through your tremolo block, use a piece of uh, shrink tubing and you push it into your tremolo hole and out through the other side. And usually, there you go, comes through, pull it all through, take off your piece of shrink rack, and there you've got your crappy, tangled up, curled up uh, old string, but you've just about got enough on there to wrap it round and tune it up, which is fab. So that's a, <coughs> that's a way of getting a string on there that would otherwise um, basically put up a fight and not go through the tremolo block. So I think people uh, you can use various different things. If you have one of those little spray nozzle pipes that come with your WD-40, you can use that. Or you can use the uh, shrink tubing, which I always do, which is very convenient. Thankfully, it fits all the way through a typical strap bridge and out the other side. Um, otherwise, we'd be in do deep doo-doo. So, in setting the guitar up, we've established that the pickups work, everything's playing, not, not even too much crackling or anything like that, which is great. Um, next thing we're going to do is do the basic setup. Um, that's the sort of next on the list of activities. Now the basic setup comprises three main parts. Um, it comprises, I don't know what the view's like down here, but let's just leave it that way because it looks like it's all right. Three main parts. We have what I would call the first fret action down here, over the first fret, between the first fret and the, um, the underside of the string. That's the first fret action, we have the neck relief, which is how curved the neck is, and we can measure that by holding down the first and last, uh, holding down the E string on the first and last frets and checking the gap in the middle, there's virtually none. Um, and then the third component is the last fret action, which is set basically by the bridge. Um, now in this case, we're, we're, I think we were just about where we wanted to be on the first, uh, the last fret sorry, the low E, last fret, if anything a fraction high, and we've got a tiny amount of adjustment room that we can do here, not much. <clears throat> and then the remainder, we just want to work downwards, so we're going from 1.5 downwards as we go across, and actually it does track across fairly well, except the B is a bit high. So we're, we're taking a, a sort of a gradient across the neck radius down to the 
low E action, which is the roughly about 1.2. So we go from 1.5 down to 1.2, and because we're following the fret, oh sorry, we're following the fret as our reference point, that preserves the the, the radius of the strings, which some people don't get. They think you have to have a gauge. Um, but if you know that your fret is whatever radius it is, this is probably a, that's a nine, maybe 9.5. Because I'm measuring my last fret action from this actual fret here, the real thing, it'll preserve the curvature as I set the string heights. Okay, so I've retuned. Um, I think, looking at this, uh, these are nines. We're going to go a little bit heavier, um, but I still think we need a little bit of uh, neck relief in here. And uh, a neck relief is uh, is there to allow your neck. Oh, my stomach's rumbling. I'm hungry. Neck relief is there to allow your neck, uh, allow your strings to move a little bit without hitting the frets. And so the frets, sorry, the strings like to move more in their centre than they do at the edges. They kind of spin round. So that's why you, you tend to need a little bit of relief or curvature in the neck. So there's none at the moment. So I'm going to take the hex key here. It's the wrong size one. Typical Yamaha. It's different. So I'm going to use the hex key, which is this one. If it will go in, where are we going? Yes. And I'm just going to, wow. Oh my holy crap, that's really tight. And I'm going to slack it off a little bit, um, just to allow the spring loading to pull some curvature. So the point of the truss rod is that it counteracts the string's tendency to curve the neck. Okay, now that's given, immediately produced some relief. Might even be a tiny bit too much, but let's have a look. Yeah, maybe, yeah, a tiny too much because we're going to put on a slightly higher grade string. So I'm going to just about a sixteenth of a turn there to just load it again a little bit. Right, so let's have a look because that may have made a small difference to the action and we've gone up just a little bit higher on this. So I'm going to take this down. These um, these little grub screws, or the, sorry, the saddles are down on their stops now so it means we're, we're as low as they can go at the edges anyway, and then we've just spread the remainder on a gradient between them. Um, but we could do, really could use the short grub screws for this whole arrangement. The only way to get around that, if it's something that you really can't live with, um, the way you have to get around it, it would be by putting a, a, a shim into the neck to raise the neck up, meaning then to meet it would raise everything else up, which men mean that these hex, hex these grub screws would disappear back down in, into the saddles and cease to be an irritation. Okay, just check again, have a look, um, maybe put a little tiny bit less. That, chain, that um, was quite all or nothing, that uh, truss rod adjustment. In fact, we've got two different, look, judging by this, we've got a different, a bit more bend on the base side than we have on the treading side. Right, these strings are horrible, so I'm not even going to uh, check the intonation at this point in the game with these strings. I'll also go off on a bit of a hunt for smaller screws so we can take care of that. Um, so let's just, uh, I'll get a check now on the first fret action. Remember the three components, first fret, last fret, and relief, neck relief. And so I'm kind of just about where I want to be with the action, uh, the last fret action. And now I want to check and see what the clearance over the over the first fret is. Now it's actually quite a lot, so we're going to set this now. Next 
important move. So I'm going to set and take off the first two strings and work with the G first of all. Zoom into there. Whoa, look. Push you back in on the telescopic whatnot. Kind of. Sort of, yeah, you can see. Not bad view. Um, so I'm using my uh, spirit gauge, no, my feeler gauge. Now, in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a V notch file to widen the notch. Um, I'm not bothered about that looks wise. I'm aiming to get the best playing slot with the most stable tuning, right? And that's the goal here. And I have to say, abstract or arbitrary aesthetic considerations don't come into it for me. I, I don't really mind what something looks like on its way to being what it should play like, which is, um, you know, the nut slot being the right depth, uh, the right width, so no friction on it and on the string, therefore no, no tuning issues, and that's my target. So I'm keeping on working this slot until it's uh, 0.3 millimeters, and it's just a matter of experience and small move, small cuts. Almost right, just about spot on there. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to put the B back in, and again we're going to have quite a space there on the B. I'm going to do the same again with the B. And cutting, notice I'm cutting backwards, so I'm sending the the angle backwards. I want the string to come up the nut and come off the front edge, cleanly off the front edge. And so I'm conscious about filing to make sure that the front edge is the bit where the height is correct. That's that's what matters. The front edge of the nut. We're almost there. Very very small adjustments, but in making the height adjustments, you probably get that I'm also making the width adjustments. Um, I've always said on all my videos um, that when we're young, you know, we, we get we get our priorities basically almost completely back to front when it comes to guitars. We get obsessed by you know the brand and the name and the cost and the pickups and whatever and the way it looks and so on. And actually, for most of us throughout our early days playing, uh, the fact that, or whether or not a guitar stays plays in tune and stays in tune is tends to be down somewhere down the priority order. But actually, when you've played for 30 or 40 years, what you suddenly realize is the guitars you reach for every time, or the ones you warm to most, are the ones that play and stay in tune. And you find that some of the ones that sh you thought you would like because they were, you know, the that fancy top range named Gibson or the, you know, the expensive, custom shop thing that you should like. That's almost on the mark and I'm not going to do anything for that. Yeah, the ones you, you on paper, you should like, or as a kid you would have liked best, uh, you don't because you just don't, don't reach for them. And the, I bet you the reason you don't reach for them mostly is that they, they take effort to get into tune. And if you can get them in tune, they, uh, they don't stay in tune. Um, and that, to me, if you look at it, actually when you line up the pro those priorities, what you find is it's almost completely upside down. So the first thing that matters in practice is the guitar plays and stays in tune. That used to be the last on your list. Hence you spent 30 years struggling with guitars that wouldn't stay in tune. Um, next on the list uh, used to be, you know, the... the the kind of look of the thing, or the, the you know, the, the, yeah, the look of the guitar. Is it a cool looking thing? Um, now, the true priority is: does it feel good to play? Is it? Is it? Does it? Does it just lend itself to playing? And um, and so it's basically the whole of the thing is back to front, which is really funny. It's not surprising because you know when we're youngsters, we don't know what's going on really, although we think we do. Okay, so this guitar is now getting close to being set the way I want it. Um, it's got a bit of relief, it's fine. We're down to the action I want on the last fret. We've got the sprouty stuff we don't want, we're gonna get rid of that. Um, we've got, a, we've got a, a ding on there on the fret, like a chip we're gonna get rid of. 
And as with many Yamahas, the, the actual playability of this isn't bad in terms of the action. So these tens, they might actually be, you know. I'm not getting anything choking out completely. So the frets are in decent condition, um, apart from that chip and apart from the wear grooves down there. Now, if, if it was just the wear grooves on their own, I definitely wouldn't um, bother fret leveling um, because in, sorry, in my book, uh, a cosmetic improvement down here isn't worth the exchange that you're paying in fret metal um, to achieve it. However, because we have to get, or to make this playable, We've got to get rid of that um, uh, chip in that fret, sick fret. So we're going to have to do that by leveling out. Now the thing is, we can't we can't do it by a spot fixing thing because what happens is you create more problems than you solve. So it's much better if you you have to make a judgment call. You think to yourself, if it was uh, if it was a huge gouge right down to the wood almost, then. You, I would probably feel more inclined to uh, replace the entire fret, but it's, it's usually, it's rarely like that. So in this case, we've got a small gouge, and I, my assessment, my estimate, is that we can we can remove it by a fairly regular normal fret leveling, and in doing so, we get the, the bonus of uh, tidying up that um, the, the where the grooves. Um, from the cowboy chords as they call them down there so that's a sort of a nice side benefit um, and you know you have to assess do you have enough fret material to do that all over leveling to remove this gouge and in this case we do the, the prints on here are not that badly worn um, and nor is the chip that deep um, dip chips are deceptive in the sense that they, they can turn out to be well, they can prove to be a lot harder to get rid of than you initially would think. Um, so they can they can catch you out because um, they're so small. You sort of assume that they're you know they don't really extend inwards, but they you know they can be a lot deeper than you think. So I'm going to go straight into the fret leveling here, and as the, the principal thing here is to clean out or clear out this um, this chip in the fret. Uh, everything else is okay and if we do get rid of the um, if we do get rid of the wear grooves down here then we're, we're sort of lucky. I mean it's a it's an added bonus but it's not our initial our, our primary target. So I'm setting up this um, happens to be just set right anyway for the starting on here so I'm going to kick straight off with leveling the E track um, and meanwhile I'm going to be thinking out to myself where I'm going to get short grub screws from. You can buy sets of them, um, obviously you know, there, there would be an additional cost but they would also, probably more importantly, they would take uh, you know, a few days to arrive and um, something like six quid for a set. Now I'm just looking straight away, I've taken some material off all these frets, it's, it, the calibration's good, it's cutting a little bit on frets here, here and here. Um, Unfortunately, it's not got down into that fret yet. I mean, that is in the B track, so uh, I won't panic too much right now. So we'll see what happens in the next track when I move across to the B. Um, but I, you know, obviously, I don't. I really don't want to take any more than I have to to get rid of this uh, this chip. So I can put this one back in, and we know everything is going to play because everything was playing well beforehand. Now I'm going to switch across to the B track, and this is where we're going to have to work our way down in this chip to get it bottomed out, if you like, so that we don't have it anymore um, and it's not interfering with play. Now, one of the things I found is you, when you're doing this, you get you can go a certain distance and then um, you can leave the rest to be cleared up by the sanding process. Um, however, you can get it wrong, and it's deemed moralizing if you get it wrong because you do all this nice hard work and then suddenly when it comes to it you suddenly find um, you've just still got the tiniest little hint of it left after you've done all the polishing and that can be such a pain because then you have to do the whole 
front leveling process again, um, which is time consuming for sure. So given that this is our principal stumbling block, the tension now is focused on, on it right here. Nearly there. I can still feel it. It's on, it's on this one here. It's right on the B track. So we're only going to get this out by working the B track. Obviously, oh, I say obviously, but I'm also going to work the rest of it um, out. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little cheat here. I'm going to add a little bit of pressure and curve the rod a tiny bit more, which is just going to push it microscopically into, I'll push it a little harder in the middle than towards the ends because I'm really keen to get rid of this chip. Um, but at the same time I'm still doing it with uh, to all the surrounding frets too so that we're not taking any one thing in particular. All right now I've just got to guess how close we are. See it's so pesky. That's a deeper, that's a, you won't see it on the camera but that's that's um, deceptively deep. It's what's happened is the guitar's fallen with the string right there and it's smacked into there. Okay, I'm going to do a little bit more. I mean, there's there's no, we've got no choice really. We're committed to removing it because, um, well, we're not. We can leave it in there, but it's a shame because it spoils the playability. So the, the target is getting rid of it so that we don't get that in the way of playing. And I can just, just see a glimpse of it, a hint of it still there. So it's, it's more fret leveling than, that's close, that's very close actually. I, th I think we could just get over that. I'm going to do a tiny whiff more and then move on. Um, yeah, so, you know, we don't want this in the way of playing. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real shame. I'm just going to go a little bit to the side again, just to even out the amount of leveling. I think that's pretty much gone, okay. So now I'm going to recalibrate on the G track. Like I say, it's more than I would like to on a guitar of this age, um, but it's for a specific reason. And we have to remember that it's it's not just fret leveling to make level frets, because we don't really need to do that on this guitar. It's fret leveling to solve this substantial problem that would spoil anyone's playing enjoyment of this guitar from now until eternity. So it's worth doing um, because it's the only way it is going to fix that short of pulling the whole fret out which is tricky because then you have to match the match the fret. Um, what have I done with this bringy thing? You have to match the fret um, with something else and then you have to actually do quite a lot of hard work to get that fret down to the same height as the others around it. And believe it or not that's not as easy as it sounds. Um, if you won't start off at exactly the same height full stop. So I've um, I've done fairly heavy in the middle too because I don't want to have a massive di difference between all of these frets now. I'm trying to trying to blend in what I've done around the whole neck as we go so it, so nothing feels different from anything else. Um, but you know we don't strictly need to do much on the others so I'm going to taper it off now as we head towards the base side. Um, so we will know, between us, we will know that I've done heavier levelling on the treble side because of that location of that chip and that problem it presented. Um, but at the same time, we will we'll get rid of most of, almost all of the play wear down at that nut end, which is good too, as a bonus. Okay, recalibrate this time now for the A and then one more after that for the E. And this is in fact, in, this is the precision part of it, or A, so it's, it's important how much of a precision activity this is because it looks simple and hey, um, look, I'm using a, a, a converted truss rod. Um, but actually, because of the, the physics involved, this is very precise. Um, I 
and it was great about it is, is if I'm not really doing it on this video because there aren't any uh, choking problems to, to demonstrate but if you were doing this and I did it on the last guitar if you're doing this because there's a choking problem or buzz or whatever um, th this method is great because the strings are on here and you're you're leveling a curve on a curve which is the same as a straight line they cancel each other out effectively um, but because that doing it that way I only do it that way for one reason and that is two reasons one is is that it allows the strings to remain on and that means unlike any other method I can if I'm getting rid of if I'm doing this specifically to get rid of chokes I can actually check that in between each go with the fret leveling tool so I never have to take away any more metal from the frets than I absolutely need to to free up the action to, uh, the frets or to level the frets to play the action I've chosen um, which is which is something you can't say of the other methods um, and that's why I like it. The second reason that I do it is because it is fractionally more accurate for technical, certain technical reasons. Now I've got quite a bit of dust kicked up there because we have to. And okay, ugly, dusty, but we're where we want to be. And I can just get a hint of it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to just do it one more time. I I want this absolutely out of the way and I'm going to slightly overcompensate, over bend it just to be sure but there's no, I've done this before and I've, I've wimped out and I've got caught out by getting to the end and still having a tiny chip and I have ended up doing the entire leveling process again and in a way it would have just been smarter if I'd have gone there in the first place but at the same time I, I, I kind of uh, I like my caution you know in that I don't want to take away any more material than I absolutely have to. So I understand my hesitation to push really hard at this. Um, but I, by the same token, you know, whilst it's great to save fret metal for a customer, I also can't afford another hour um, to invest in it when it hasn't quite worked. Okay, that has. That's done. Okay. Put that in there, put that in there, close up the fret leveling box, put it up on the, on the roof space. Filthy fingers. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take these hair strings off. I think I'm going to bin these because they're so filthy. Um, and then tonight, in a second, I'm just going to uh, reprofile these frets. So leveling them has put a flat spot on many of them which is, is bound to do that as we take away the Im imperfections or whatever, you know, in some cases it's take away the un unusually high parts of the fret, or in this case it's, we've had to flatten it to take away the, uh, the dent, the chip in the fret. And so it's flattened them off to some degree or other. And we don't need, we don't want flat frets because they're playable, but we want, first of all, we want smooth frets, but we also want them really to be fret shaped the way they were in the beginning and um, not least because it plays better but it also allows the uh, makes the intonation more accurate because the intonation center is dead center of the fret instead of being at the front edge um, which it is when you have a flat spot so to do that we're going to reprofile them with this uh, stumac tool and a way to do that is to mark them all up again black marker pen and this is a guide to where we've cut and where we haven't as it was the first time around and so as I use this next tool what we're going to do is we're going to the concave cutting uh, face of the tool will go over the flat uh, tops of these frets and it will effectively start by cutting off the sharp edges or the shoulders I call it and then it will do that and I'll do that until um, I've taken this black line and reduced it down to a thin black line and that tells me that I have reshaped this fret as close as I can to an arch uh, but without, as long as I leave a little thin strip of marker pen down the middle, uh, it tells me I haven't touched the top of the fret um, which means I haven't lowered it any and that's critical because otherwise we'd be undoing the good work. Now I don't know if you can see but right here now there's a little hint of the dent there from the 
cowboy court and you can see that I haven't gone chasing to remove that. I'm going to live with that and we're going to sand that out as good as it can be. But it's always a secondary benefit, it's never the primary reason for levelling. Um, and if it, as you can see there, if it doesn't get there by the time we've done the main the levelling for the main reason we've done it, the main purpose, then we live with that. Um, I'm not prepared to trade fret life for what's really just a cosmetic um, blemish. Those, those grooves almost never actually get in the way of play. They don't look great and people often, I've had people come and ask me to refret or yeah, refret guitars because of it. Um, but if you look at Brian May's Red Special, which he's played arguably, he says, for 50 years without fretting or refretting, um, you'll see that every single fret has got substantial grooves on it and he plays it exactly that way and it doesn't, you don't hear his strings clicking or skipping or anything. So those grooves in the frets from the strings uh, from normal play actually have to be down to the wood before they can cause any problems. Um, a, a one kind of fret damage that does cause problems uh, is where you have a zero fret and the strings, because they sit on the zero fret uh, all the time without moving from side to side practically, they, they're usually just pressing on one spot on the zero fret. Because of that they, uh, they very quickly wear a notch and that notch really is clicky. Um, so that's a, that's a situation where you really do want to replace the fret, um, the zero fret because that clickiness, as soon as you bend it, it'll be like uh, we heard there, it'll, it'll click and just be horribly distracting. Um, so, you know, if you have a, a guitar with a zero fret, be prepared to replace the zero fret regularly. Um, you'd be surprised how quickly. I had, a, I had a Brian May Red Special for about six months, eight months or something, not long. Um, it's a longish story. Uh, I bought it as a treat to myself, and I sold it because it really didn't do anything for me that I wanted. Um, in fact, it didn't do anything for me that my own own made, my home built, own built guitars couldn't do. So it wasn't really any point having it, and I wasn't using it much. But anyway, the point of the story is um, that in just six months, if that, of very little use, uh, it, the zero fret notched, just sitting there on my wall, uh, hardly being played, which is pretty damning, really. Um, so you have to be prepared for that, and actually they should, they come, they should come ship with a, a stainless steel zero fret at all times. It's just crazy not to, because it guarantees a trip to the luthier, which you by rights you shouldn't necessarily have to do within six months of a, getting a brand new guitar. Anyhow, so look, the hard stuff is done, but the one more thing I will do before we go anywhere else, I'm going to get a little piece of this 180, actually 180, I'm going to get a little piece of 240, 240 grit paper and I'm going to go down the edge of this fingerboard because we're going to get rid of these sprouting frets. Now there is practically no way you're going to do this without hitting, at some point, hitting the uh, finish. It's kind of impossible. So there's different people have different ways. Some people use a circle, some people use a flat thing with a block. I use a, a flattened tube like this. Right? And what I do is I get hold of this and I go start with, first of all, we go down here and we'll, we'll take off the sprouting, uh, whatever that stuff is, um, the filler, okay? So right, right down flat. Now just be very careful you're not running it against the finish. Okay, so that's now turned that into a flat thing, but it's still got a bit of the fret sprout. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do the other side in the same way. Just to, and kind of snip off the, the filler that's coming out. 
Um, 240 is actually quite effective. These are, these are very lightly finished anyway, these things, so there's not a lot of lacquer to take off. Um, but you know, you, you have to be aware that it will take some off. Now you can sand it back to a nice finish and the fingers will never know the difference and it, it won't be unpleasant at all to touch. Um, and, but if you're really worried, you can then hand apply some poly uh, on top of that, which, which is quite often what I've done uh, when I've had to, is just go back and paint some poly. Uh, I use water-based poly, so I paint it on and then um, sand it out over time. Now at this point now, I'm, I'm now concentrating on the fret ends themselves. And I'm just going backwards and forwards catching the sharp fret ends as much as possible and I want to flap them back so it's a, it's a matter of gauging the the angle of the end and I can feel it and I can see it sharp shining up the, uh, the frets whilst clipping off any immediately sharp ends and the fact that this is done with a finger rather than a block funnily enough helps to helps to kind of curve the paper around the frets so what you get is a much smoother finish. Now sometimes you will get, even when you do this, the fret ends look really nice now, but sometimes you'll get a, um, the little inside edges of these will be just slightly sharp still, just because that's what you'll get when you make this flat and straight, if you get what I mean. It'll, it'll cause the, the downside of getting this flat is that the little edges here get sharp. Um, so what you what I probably would do then is go back over the uh, frets with a little fret file and just take out those little obstructing sharp edges. Um, and the nice thing about doing that is, or doing any of this, is that we're working with 240 grit right now. Um, I'm just going to cut this back so I can reuse both of these end bits and clear off the nasty stuff. Um, so we've, we've, we've just done the reprofiling, we've done the fret leveling, we're now doing the, the fret end softening. So first of all it doesn't matter if you skip and miss like I just did because we're going to also polish out the frets now with a successive range of different grades of paper until it's nice and shiny, until the frets are nice and shiny. So we've got a, a nice sort of slow controlled process from here on inwards so that any sharp bits or it, for example if now when I go over with my file any oops there goes a hex key any uh, sharp bits resulting from using my file will be picked up um, picked up and softened off in the next part of the process so I can feel the edges feel good now this the, fr the sprouty filler stuff has mostly gone actually there's a little bit left there mostly gone let's get rid of this bit so you have to be uh, willing to come further down the fingerboard to get this stuff if it's sticking out you can't wimp out to preserve the uh, finish you just have to trust that we've got to get rid of it and then you can feel it for yourself okay everything's nice and smooth now and then the next stage is my little uh, file here is I'm just going to go up every little edge here and then come back the other way and this this then just takes away the little burr and then any roughness of this file will take away as we sand out the frets in a minute when we mask off the fingerboard and do the, the more extensive fret polishing which will go through a series of grades from a uh, sorry, 600 to 1000 to 1500 and then on into a series of micro mesh papers and at the end of it we'll have a nice plain finish the frets will look like they've, they're brand new um, and will be uh, yeah just be you won't notice any work done on them at all except it will just feel nice and look nice so I'm just going to run back down here just get rid of these little tiny corner spikes and as we go down with the lighter and lighter papers I'll also double over and go down the edge of here so that even actually if there's no more 
lacquer on the edge, or poly I should say, and then we'll finish on the edge. It'll still come out smooth and shiny, um, and it's, it's such a thin finish on this guitar anyway, you don't really need to go to the trouble of building it back up because it'll just feel nice and smooth and shiny anyway. So again, when you get down here, you have to be a little bit careful that you don't slip onto any finish. Okay, so those are the treated frets recovered from their sharpness, and it will take a bit of work. Um, if if you if you're in the mood and you want to do it straight away, we can get a piece of a piece of five uh, five hundred six hundred right now, and for example, we could wrap it up here in using the two forty as a sort of filler tube. We just start off like this, wrap it up, and uh, maybe squash it out, get a bit more bend on it, and then basically down we go down the side, polish up a little bit on the um, finish here, and then lean over into the frets, and we're looking to both shine it up and soften out, and then we want the we want the paper to kind of go in and up and down on the edge of the frets, and it tears into bits and that, but it's it's, um, we're just trying to soften out those rough edges so we can sacrifice some 600 grit of paper for the purpose of that. Um, some people tend to use a, um, do a very thin tube instead, so let's see if we can do it. Anyway, we uh, think between. Oh, that's a lot. We just we just went out to the supermarket a bit earlier. When on the previous video, I'd been talking a little bit about the uh, coronavirus and what it means coming, you know, hitting Britain. And so we we were out doing a sort of a bit of not panic buying, but strategic buying. Um, and it's a funny thing to be out in a kind of a public space like a supermarket thinking, well, there's been a reported case in North Devon. Uh, somebody's gone into quarantine up there because they were in a, on a trip to Italy and came back with symptoms. So it's now not far away. So we were kind of talking about how long our ordinary stores of food, the stuff that you never want to eat, you know, how long would that last if you were if you were in a sort of lifeboat situation and you, you literally had nothing else and you had to make it last, how long would it last? It's quite interesting to think about it and I just we you probably figured it would be um, maybe, a, maybe a month or something, which isn't such a bad thing after all. Um, hey there you are. Right, so um, I'm going to call it a day, um, safe in the knowledge that the precision part of this setup is done. I might have a look around tomorrow for some more, or see if I can find any uh, arms for the traveller. Is there any knocking about inside the house? I doubt there will be. But the precision levelling part is done. We've taken care to rework the end. Um, we can shine it up even more as we go through with the different grades of paper. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll replace that with, uh, we'll do it now actually, we'll replace the, the string tree with uh, a Tusk one. It's, it's a, I think it's a very sensible change investment on anything, five quid or something. Um, including postage. So it's worth uh, having something like this because it'll it'll uh, take away any of the friction on the strings. Because now we've, we've got the nut right and we've stretched or we'll stretch out the new strings. The last thing we want is that stability, that tuning stability messed up by a piece of metal gripping the strings down here. It's a horrible device. And I, I know they've on there, you know, they've put them on the original straps way back, but this still doesn't make them a nice device, I tell you. Right, that's it for today. I'm going to go in and get something to eat. See you tomorrow when I've cleaned up. Uh, thanks for watching. See you later.
the hello. Oh, it's a windy day. Right, we're back on the on the case. I'm going to uh, I'm going to just uh, this. I'm quite got this clean, so I'm going to give this another going over with my stuff and see if it's if I can get it a bit more cleaned up. Um, yes, it's uh, Saturday, and uh, Claire's gone off up to Edinburgh to see the new granddaughter. So she's really thrilled and of course I'm kind of nervous about her being in an, uh, two airports twice if you get what I mean. Um, so I really could wish that wasn't happening but it is and you just have to maintain hand hygiene and hope for the best. Um, anyway, I know that she's thrilled to see the new baby. Anyway, so here we are on the Saturday, picking up where I left off with rattle, 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 um, Gary's Pacifica. I'll just get these last bits of gunge off the fingerboard so it's nice and clean. I think that's all good. Neighbours singing, how nice. I've also taken the bridge off because I'm going to give that a clean as well while we're at it. Um, I thought what I might try and do for fun, oops I've lost the two little spacers, they, they're quite cool, they put little nylon spacers in here for the outer um, bridge posts, or the outer bridge screw holes. Um, let's see what this I also should do at this point. Right, well now I'm at it, about it. I'm going to, no, not because I'm going to do the, I'm going to do the sanding in a minute. Um, so that goes there. Let's, 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 let's. I need to get this taped up. Um, and then we'll be ready to polish the fret out. At the moment, I've got this guitar hanging up here, which is slightly in the way. This is my left-handed uh, MG, which is a sort of real of guitars interpretation of a, an SG. So it's got all the weight in the body that the SG hasn't got. So as a result, it's uh, not unbalanced the way an SG often is. So we'll just leave that there like that. Okay, so we've got this filthy old thingy here. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take this apart and while we're on camera, I'm gonna see what the options are see whether we can uh, tap and drill and tap a, no, whatever, a new thing. Or we can either tap a different hole in there or we can try and modify one of my tremolo arms. I think I'll probably do that first. But it would be good to get access to the, uh, the zinc block before we try and do that. Obviously it's got to be exact um, to work, but these things will usually be one, one, one size or another. And I think it's, I suspect it's um, metric still, um, just smaller than the regular ones, just the choice, manufacturing choice. So I'm going to have these two um, guitars, uh, this one and Matitz's uh, Harley Benton, ready to go to a Monday morning, which will be cool. Um, I've got to find a set of grub screws out of all of my spares. I'm going to find a grub screw, to, uh, some grub screws, shorter ones I hope, because right now, with the way this is set up, the uh, the, with the saddle all decked out on the floor, the uh, grub screws all sticking up, which, which will make, see these are loose, but hey, it'll make um, palm muting uncomfortable. Now the thing about this is it's a fairly standard tremolo. Um, what they've done is they've just put on their own size uh, 
tremolo here. Let me see if I can see through here. I can't really see the, uh, can't very well see the thread. So we've got we've got the, um, the sort of temporary one that we can use, but that doesn't really go that far into there. It only goes far enough in just to push it. Then we've got this one here. I sort of wonder whether we could cut another um, gauge straight onto it. Let's see if we can work out what it currently is. Okay, so we have, I haven't done this before, I've never tapped, put a thread on an object, so I've, I've made threads in holes, I've drilled holes and made threads, if you get what I mean. So this is looking at 572, 520 on the diameter, and then it goes a bit wider than that for the threads to 586. So I presume that has to be an M6. Um, I mean, I'm guessing, but let's see what we've got, because we've got this device here. Like I said, I've never done this before. So what have we got? We've got an M5. Hey, look, we've got an M6. So is this how you do it? You stick that in there and... So you have to use this thing. Da, 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 da. Oops, never done it before. Um, right there, what's that? M M3 and it says 0 0.5, 0 0.7. That says M6, 1. I don't even know what that means. Somebody will know. <laughs> but they won't tell me in time. I'm just guessing, right? Here's my, here's my locking device. So we've got this thing, and like I say, I've never done this end of the game before, and I probably should have gone and watched a video or some such. So we put this in here, and that sort of sort of locks it in place a bit clunkily, I have to say, but we'll see. Hmm. So. We have the tapery lead-in bit. I'm guessing that what you do is you put this fella in here, and you lead it on into the onto the thing. Now, this will who knows what this will do because it's not the right gauge to begin with. So, if we can just get a bite on it, which we may not be able to do at this rate. best angle in the world but you know what it might just do let's just see this is a spare so I can check it away now this feels a similar sort of size I have to say maybe it is just enough to change the threading now we're going on to the bare stuff so it's going to cut a little bit harder let's just see what we've got now this is not the right size at all, then we can go down, but I I kind of there's only a couple of possibilities that it could be. <laughs> well look at that. Hmm. That's not bad, I think. That's just about a fit. Let's put this on again and just Take it around one more time. Okay, so it's a bit of a, a tilt on it, but it's not that bad. It's definitely comfortable. Let's put the thread on that. Go a bit further along, back up. Further. Hmm. Nice. See, if necessary, we could cut a bit off this and work with just the fresh bit of the thread, which is this bit here. Well, mind you, cutting it will leave a bit of a, a ragged, um, a ragged. Uh, edge which is quite hard to get into a into a thread that already exists. 
So let's see. Uh, what I don't want to happen is that we put it in here and it kind of goes in, but then <coughs> ends up busting out the cracking the thread or cracking the, the block, which is possible. Um, okay, that's one possibility. To me, that feels like it's almost the right size. Um, looks like it. Let's just put these on for a second and see how far that sits out. Spare. In fact, I threw a lo away a load of these spare squire style um, blocks the other day because um, I never get to use them. They just they just sit around and um, yeah get trashed at some point. So that that's interesting. So that's uh, slightly. It's the right thread to go in there, but it's slightly too big still to go through this plate, I think. Let's try. Yeah, could be. Take this off. Uh -huh. So, uh, in terms of size, what do we have? Six. I don't think there's a... There won't be a five and a half, is there? No, M3. M8, M10, M4, M9, M12, uh, and M7. So it's, uh, it's either going to be, the only thing it possibly could be is a 4 to go into that thing. But let's just have a quick look here. Yeah, so that's, that's almost too tight. So could it be an M4? Well, we could only try, couldn't we? We put an M4 in there and waste this arm. Could chug it away if it doesn't work. Let's try that for fun. Mmm. Lovely sound of the neighbours coughing their guts up. Ugh. Putrid. Ugh. That's really weird. Why doesn't that fit flat? It's, it's holding on to this thing here. It's not that way around, is it? Or is it? No, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to want to sit flat, whichever way you do it. Not quite, anyway. Okay, so this. Uh, Here's the open bit. I think this is this is the wrong size to even begin with. So on a piece of, we'd have to we'd have to cut this down. It's too big. It's too big a, a thread. I suppose what we have got is one that fits in here. This this actually could be a candidate for this. We could get this to bite on here if we could. Where's the where's the entry point? Kind of obvious on that one. That's weird. It's got to be this bit here, but hard to uh, hard to see the start point. So this is 5.2. And then first of all, we know that goes through there. If we do an M5 on there, I don't think we can do a. We can't do a four on that thread there, it's too, it's too small. Um, let's go backwards and see if I can put a workable thread on this thing here. Let us see what we can do. They're all spare chuckaways anyway, so I'm not too worried about that. Okay, so we have, it's very it's always interesting how you get a sort of start bite on something like this. 
and you kind of get one in there and you go on, bite it. There you go. Oh well, that's as good as it's going to be. Ooh, a little coil of metal coming out there. Nice. There we are. Chew it up. Yeah, better than nothing. Um, Gary can have this for free because it's really only until and if, if and until, and he wants to, uh, well, can find another one. That's the correct one for the Yamaha. Okay, we'll, we'll see if this fits. I know it'll fit because the last one did, but the question is, is, is it the right fit? I mean, the, for all I know, the the Yamaha might be working on an Imperial, but I don't recall it being that. So we do know that that goes through there. That's good. And we do expect this to fit in here, which is well, it's not bad, actually. It's not that far in. Let's have a look how far in it is. Halfway. I think we can work with that, can't we? Why don't we just go with that? Um, yes, this is better than having no tremolo working on there at all. that the corroded springs as well for some new ones because it's one of those things I've got a ton of and that never get used it's windy um, yeah a ton of them and they never get used so I'll give them a go right well as far as I'm concerned this will work far enough to uh, to be usable Doesn't you know? It doesn't matter. That it's not the original. Okay, that's fun. Um, let's give these a quick clean. Ah, oh, right. Next, next thing. Grub screws. Oh, I've got. Pretty, it's, it's pretty windy out there. Um, I've got two different saddles, strat saddles. Um, Strat saddles, strat saddles. I've got some, I've got quite a lot of grub screws in lots of different places. Um, the question is, is which of them end up being shorter than the ones I've currently got? Well, there's a short ones. Let's get my thing here. Uh, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. Right, this is only going to help a little bit. I uh, Hopefully, the Yamaha ones will be standard width. Um, just double check these against these. Yeah, a little bit shorter, better than nothing. We'll, we'll use them. These uh, I'm almost never going to be using. Certainly, certainly never going to be using these. So this, I know that I've got some really short ones here, which we'll use for the outside. Look, that's great. Six mils. God. So outer ease. Outer ease. Now to ease. In between ease ones, in between the ones, uh, short, long, long, longish, shortish. Ooh. Seriously windy. This will just hopefully take some of the pain out of using the, uh, you know, resting on the saddle. I mean, these are as as good as scrap, really. 
but they're just handy for cannibalizing spare parts. Um, I can always get a whole useful one out of it at some point in the future, should I need it. But the, uh, the number of times I've actually gone to these for anything, to take anything, uh, is minimal. Okay, they're all the same. Uh, maybe they're short. Shorter. One, two, three, four, five. One, one more set of these. These, the ones I'm picking out here are considered the, the short ones out of a, a regular set. But because of the position at the moment, or because of the way this. Um, uh, the, because of the way that the saddles on this Yamaha are sitting flat on the deck, even the, what's considered short, the regular short ones are too long. If you get what I mean, anyway. Um, that's that. I know where there's some more. Some more left in here. the heater on but it's not exactly warming me up. Uh, grub screws. Here we have grub screws. Oh my lordy. We have a ton of things. Right. We've got a set of longish ones. We've got a set of black ones which are fairly long. And in here we have some short ones. Now, it would be quite cool, depending on what we've got. We've got one, two, Three, um, three, one, two, three. Damn, I just put that spare one away. Let's just go through our four. Here's a spare one. Right, so we've actually got, we can get rid of two of these. One, two, so one set of shorties, 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 longy, longy, shorty, shorty. Right, there's our complete set for the purpose of this little replacement thing. And that's going to be taking a few minutes of fiddling to put them together, but it's going to make it a better, a better play, playing experience uh, for Gary. Right, there you go. This doesn't really belong in there, but I'm going to put it in there anyway. Am I? No, because it doesn't fit. Maybe. Right, we're still running. Okay, so all of these bits, oh no, I was going to say they're all out, but they're not. So I'm going to take all of these out. Well, before I do, let's just check one thing, that they are in fact the right size, because otherwise we'll be wasting our time. Please, please, please. Yes. Okay, that's good. So we'll carry on with the undoing. Look at the length of those babies. Um, so we're going to make our set of, this quite works out pretty much because the highest lift is going to be in the middle, on the middle strings and this will coincide with the slightly longer ones there. Um, so it'll actually feel pretty much like the saddles, the grub screws have disappeared, which is the intention. Okay. Uh, ah. You see how fiddly this is. So my little bit of, uh, bless you, Ooh, you sound like you might have coronavirus. Uh, my, my little uh, attempt at cutting the new thread there was a first. Like I say, I've done, I've cut threads in holes. Yes, I've cut threads in holes, but not in, not on rods. But it's good fun. I'd like to do more of it. Metal work. Just so happens that my friend and neighbour Rod has uh, some pretty extensive metalwork stuff capability down in his workshop, along with the fully fully equipped woodworking thing. There's a short one. Okay, so this is the middle one, the G, and then we're going to get to the D. Mm 
<sighs> when your hands are a little bit cold and they don't work brilliantly well, it's hard grasping small things. Never been very dexterous, dexterous since my bike crash all those years ago. I lost a lot of fine fine tuning in my hands, both of them. Which is a price you pay for surviving and not being killed on the spot. For which I was very grateful at the time. 1996 it was. Flashback. Mm -hmm. Summer's evening, June the 25th. About 7.30pm. And I, a friend of mine, I was staying at a friend's house and her boyfriend was cooking us some food and she said, take me out for that ride on your bike, she said, like you promised all those months ago, which I had. So it was such a perfect summer's evening. I said, all right. And so we got helmets on, gloves on, and off we went. And uh, I rode from Newport, where she lived, to Usk, which was about 10 miles away or something. Uh, and um, we got to Usk, turned round and came and parked by the river. Looked at the river for a short while on such a beautiful evening. And then thought, right, we better get back because uh, Rick was making pasta or something. And so we got back on the bike set off and uh, coming down a, a straight bit of road with a bit of a downhill thingy slope on it um, I, uh, I must have in retrospect I must have seen a, a sort of farmer's land, land rover parked at the, um, the side road clear visibility you could see me for a, should be should have been able to see me from quite some way off um, but as it happened we were going down about 50 miles an hour and the speed limit was 50 and I was sticking to it because it was a it was a really nice relaxed evening and um, anyway as I got to the junction in the road he uh, pulled out and there was nothing I could do and so we and there was a split second of braking, but it wasn't effective <laughs> at that range. There was no. It was. It was as I was on top of him, as if he had not seen us at all. And you know, when you think back and you realise that if somebody hasn't seen you, they're going to do that thing, and it just looks like they're driving into the side of you. It never looks like they're gambling and trying to sneak out, but don't quite make it. They haven't seen you, and they they literally pull out into you. I've had that happen since actually on another or roundabout but um anyway so i was i was riding a kawasaki gt 750 an old one i was just barely about keeping going times were hard and all that stuff and um anyway he pulled out in his land rover an old one of the old model land rovers a series or something and um i just remember I don't really remember anything visually. I remember a sort of blast of metallic adrenaline. As, and you know, there was that moment of absolute knowledge and certainty that that's going to be it. I'm going to hit it. Uh, there's no way around it. And uh, and we did. And it was just a. It wasn't pain exactly. It was. It was just a, a massive impact naturally and um, and then all I remember is waking up in the peace and quiet of the country you know the sort of I suppose after a huge big impact everything goes quiet um, and you kind of lie there in shock um, you don't know where you are or what's happened exactly we well, kind of do but it's all a bit wow massive um, and I remember lying there I, I, I remember being aware that I was alive and therefore you know it's pretty 
easy to put two and two together. Um, and uh, I remember kind of lying on my back in this dappled sunshine, um, in this beautiful, blissful silence, with the birds tweeting, and the silence was almost echoing. It was it was very sweet and. The, it was warm and it was peaceful and quiet and I wasn't in any pain or anything. I just remember a very warm buzzing feeling in my hands. Um, and then I sort of don't quite remember, but uh, I, I know somebody arrived and, and then somebody, I think somebody took my helmet off, which they probably shouldn't have done. Or maybe the ambulance did, I don't know. Anyway, um, I remember not much about being on the road, and then I remember being in the ambulance. I remember the ambulance people asking me those questions to try and acetate, acetate, acetate my mental state. That'd be a good rap. Um, you know, what day is it? And I think I couldn't get the day right. Um, but I, I, I could remember my my wife's name and phone number, although we were separated at the time, so it wasn't, well, I had no choice but to contact her, because my kids needed to know what had happened. Um, anyway. So I remember, vaguely remember, um, sort of, it, fragments of the trip to A&E and then I vaguely also remember um, I remember being spasming my back spasming it was the weirdest thing it was the most look at this wire it's out to catch me every time damn you it's like a I don't know it's like some sort of octopus it gets its hooks into you um, yeah, so it was really, uh, it was really a blur, and, and, and I remember, like I say, I remember my back spasming, and uh, even though my, my, it was my clearly my wrists were in a bad way, um, the thing I remember was this agonising, excruciating spasm because I'd gone over or sideways down the road and landed on my back, um, and they weren't really. They weren't really doing anything to my back. They were sort of focused on my broken wrists more than anything, which was fair enough. Um, but I was, I was kind of I was wanting them to take care of my back. But anyway, they took care of my wrists first, which is fine. And um, and then I kind of remember being in probably given painkillers and going all drifty you know as you do and then I think I remember people starting to turn up and my mum kind of wringing her hands and going oh no what have you done and, um, and then I say kids actually my, my I only had my son at the time Elliot and my wife brought Elliot she came around and Elliot came with her I have a photograph from that time somewhere of of me looking very gaunt and haunted actually as you do when you've been in an accident um, wrong way with uh, with Elliot that's interesting is that sticking up too far no, it is sticking out a little bit so they've used these Quite clever. They've used these little nylon spacers to, to lift the front edge of the tremolo above the deck. And what you want to do is you want to tighten up far enough, but not so far that you pull down the uh, plate. It's a mistake that often is made. So as soon as you feel you're pulling on that plate like that, back off. And really, these don't need to be tight at all. They need to be backed off more than anything. And sometimes what I see as well is people have changed these tremolo screws 
along the way for another set from somewhere, maybe because they're cleaner or not so rusty. Um, but even the smallest fraction of a difference in the actual size of these tremolo screws will stop the uh, tremolo operating. So what you really want is um, that, at this stage, completely free movement. Free movement of tremolos. And then you get your new springs. Now, this had originally five springs on it, and I'm not going to put five springs back on it because it doesn't need that many to do what we want it to do. Which is, if I can just get this in the hole, I need a different gauge. It has some... Maybe these are a different gauge. I have a feeling these might be thinner. Well, we're only going to use three as it is, so let's use the three... I think three of the original ones. Um, yeah, we don't need... Uh, we don't need so much force. When you lock down the tremolo, you, um, you can do it just by uh, screwing in the claw. Um, but you only need to screw it in as far as is required to hold the gauge of strings you're working with flat on the deck. And we'll see how much that is later on. But right now, we don't need, uh, we don't need too much force on there. So I'm just gonna just go back and tweak these so they look tidy, but they're not pressing down on the front at all. Um, and now it's in place, held back by the springs. And we'll see a bit later on if they're enough. We can put these to one side. They're not really necessary. Um, now the next stage in this will be to polish out the frets and then we'll come to re-stringing um, and so on. And we know that we can now fit this temporary, you know, workable. Now the thing is, if that's if by the time we put the uh, strings on, this we want this when we put the strings on, we want this still to be flat against air. We want enough um, pull on the springs. And if we find that in fact it goes like that, we need more pull. But when we when we get the balance just about right, this will then become light, and you can actually use it in, a, in quite a nice, um, tasteful way. Again, it's purely a temporary, you know, replacement thing, but it will do. Okay, so I'm going to go off the camera on this bit because what I'm going to do is spend time tape this all up, um, and then I'm going to polish all the frets out. All right, we've we've uh, come on, stick, please. We've um, leveled them, we've reprofiled them or crowned them, depending on which techno terminology you prefer. Um, so the next bit now is to polish them out so they look like new frets again and any leveling marks or anything we've done to them will disappear. The only thing we may end up with left is possibly a little mark here where we didn't get bottom out at some of that uh, low fret play wear. But remember we weren't, we weren't going after that specifically. That was a sort of, if we got rid of most of it, it was a happy byproduct. Um, so I'm not, I didn't want to take any fret metal unnecessarily chasing after that because just to remind you, it is only a cosmetic thing. It, it doesn't get in the way and, of playing, and it certainly doesn't actually hamper the notes in any technical way, so it doesn't affect your intonation and so on. Um, I sometimes get uh, questions about things to do with intonation, which people shows me that people completely don't understand what intonation is. Um, and I, I don't mean that in a put down way because you know when I didn't know I didn't know um, but some people think things like uh, I don't know I can't think now it's always when you come to think of an example um, but intonation is a, a physical issue right we, we we check it and set it by reference to tuning because that's how we are, we use sound to measure the distance right and that's why we use it a 12th fret harmonic to check the distance. Um, but because basically we can't check it with a ruler that accurately. Um, but they, they, even though we're using sound at that point, we are still basically only dealing with distance. Um, and they, so the issue of intonation is nothing more mysterious than making sure that the, each of the strings is set the correct length 
for the particular neck we're using. That might sound confusing, mouthful of stuff, but the point is um, necks are made to one of several standard scale lengths. Right? And the reason they do that is they come, they have to settle on an average or standard or a series of standards um, to make manufacturing possible, right? That's the first obvious thing. So you couldn't just randomly make them and, and choose a, a different length of the neck each time. And the reason why they stick to some standard scale length is so that they, um, so that they know, basically there's a calculation that they do based on the nominal scale length of the neck. So if you say, for example, I'm making a, a 25 and a half inch neck um, strat scale, then that 25 and a half inch measurement is what is a is the important variable, one of the most important, well it's the variable, but it's an important number that goes into the calculation which tells the maker, manufacturer, uh, how far apart the frets are um, as they move down the neck. In other words, the, the rate at which they get closer together. Um, so so there's, a, there's an equation for that, and, and like I said, the, the most important variable that gets entered into that equation to, to determine where those frets fall, and that's the scale length. So all necks with 25 and a half inches have the 25 and a half put into the equation, and lo and behold, the position of the frets comes out the same on all 25 and a half inch necks. Um, on a shorter scale length, you put in your 24 and three quarters or whatever it is, and guess what? The result is that the spaces between all the frets are slightly different, and they they uh, they get closer together as you go down the neck at a different rate. Um, so the standard neck is manufactured. Um, like I say, people make them to usually one of three or four or five different standard scale lengths. Now that would be simple if that's all there was to it, but that's not the only variable that's in, in, the, in the matter of intonation. So that each, um, I was going to go off to this, but I just want to finish what I'm saying. Each string has uh, its own specific length when on uh, a neck built to a certain scale length. So, for example, this has got a 648, probably, yeah, 648 scale length, which is a notional, a nominal line drawn down just somewhere about there, usually about where your first saddle sits. But all the strings actually end up being slightly longer. So you get a pattern of saddles like I've done here. So that each string, ultimately, because it's made differently, a different thickness and a different composition, um, you tend to find it needs a slightly longer playing length, right? So it's a scale length plus an actual little bit extra. Um, and that's what's necessary to make all the notes along here play uh, in tune. And it's it's a funny situation to be in, but that's how that's how we how it ends up. And what's incredible is that on a, on every guitar um, the patterns for intonation are very, very consistent and reliable. So uh, for example, on a on the guitar with three wound strings and three plain strings, you tend to get two patterns of two sets of three. First one, the, the thinnest plain string is always the shortest, and that usually comes in at the nominal scale length, around about 648 on this kind of guitar. Then the plain B is a little further back because it's thicker. Then the plain G is a little further back because it's thicker again. But because the D is the first wound string, it tends to need to be forward and it, it comes back just a little bit behind, usually. I haven't said it exactly yet, but it comes back a little bit in front of this, um, this one here, so it comes back a bit. And then the A is the next wound one, which steps back from the D, and the E is the next wound one, which steps back from the uh, A, because it's thicker again. So you get these two little groups of three for all guitars that are, I'm sorry, I'm just knocking into the um, clamp there, uh, two sets of three in that pattern. And what's great is if you don't have that pattern, if you put your, you string up your guitar and you try test the intonation and you find that one of those strings is a mile out, uh, provide, I mean, so for example, if I put it on a wound G string, this would need to be forward. 
All right, it would be, in fact, it would be forward of the wound, the saddle for the wound D, and uh, so it would look quite different. Um, but if you have three plain and three wound, and you put them on, and you find that, let's say, the A is way forward or has to be way back to read intonated on your tuner, then actually you can trust this pattern business so uh, solidly that you can pretty much throw away that string, put a new one on, and lo and behold, it'll intonate in the right place. Because this little pattern of two sets of three is consistent. It's, it's just how it works, providing the strings are made the same and they're you know, three, three plain followed by three wound. So you get to, used to that, and I now trust that. I used to spend for hours trying to intonate one rogue string with, and end up with one of these out of the sequence that looked really odd. Um, and I now trust it, and if I get one out of sequence, I'll just throw that string away. And I won't even question, spend any time thinking, why is it like that? I can't see anything wrong with it, and so on. I'll just bin it, and I'll get a new one, and every time I've done it, and every time I've done it and recommended someone else do it who was having a problem, they solved their problem exactly the same, and they, they like me, were amazed. How can it be? What's wrong with the string? And the thing is, you'll never know, but it could be a tiny bit of difference in the weight of the coils or the thickness of the coils that throws it off because it's the the thing that there are the two things in, involved the three things there's the length there's the thickness and then there's the the winding the two three main things that affect where that string will intonate and if it's built differently or wrong or there's a flaw in its manufacture um, one of those things will be different again from all the rest in the pack and you'll get this strange anomaly effect um, but trust the three and three pattern or if you've got a wound g the two and four pattern because that's also very consistent and you'll see that turn up uh, the two and the three and three pattern turns up in typical modern compensated bridge right there's your three and three again um, a lot of these compensated wraparound bridges you actually find one two three four and then the two top ones step back and if you have one of those it will be for a wound G as opposed to a plain one. So that the, the issue of uh, intonation is only ever about distance. Right? You just have to have the right length for the string that you've got on that neck remembering that that neck is built manufactured to a nominal scale length and in which the position of the frets is determined by an equation in which the nominal scale length is an important uh, input or variable. And we know that as a rule of thumb on a guitar like this, your, your um, nominal scale length always makes a, you know, from the nut, front edge of the nut to down here, the way that line falls is usually, you can be fairly safe and say it's usually the place where your high E will start from. Um, very rarely will it be much back from that. But your other strings will go back from that in, a, in that three and three pattern that we just mentioned. So whatever you do, if you're, you know, you're ever unsure, you, you absolutely don't want to place your bridge too far back so that even when this is wound right out, you can't quite reach that uh, scale length because you've got nowhere to go then. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quite a challenging little game to get them right. I've done it loads of times, and I've still found myself placing things just a hair's breadth, meaning I have to place the saddles a bit further back than I'd like to get it intonated. Um, but, you know, the question, the, the only question is, is well, as you're coming to place a bridge, you're saying to yourself, is the, um, you know, do I position it so that my first, my high E saddle is on the uh, no, nominal scale length line or don't I? And that's really all you're asking. And my experience has been that it usually is that your high E is on that 648 line or the 628 if it's on a uh, Les Paul style guitar. Okay, so I'm just, uh, just covering off the uh, tape. Really here I'm doing, it's mainly just 
first of all protecting the fingerboard, but I'm also um, just usually protecting just this area here. So if I come down here with the tape, it's not going to scuff the finish at all. Okay. So having talked all the way through that, what I'm going to do now is go off camera, and I really will do my sanding process off camera. I'm going to do thousand, sorry, six hundred, one thousand. 600, 1000, and 1500 grit, followed by a set of micro mesh papers through from, from 1500 through to 12,000, which is very fine indeed, and that will be polishing it out right at the end there. So it'll, it'll be a good looking result. Keep half of that for the next setup, and then stay where you are and then we're using these bits here and the reason I go off camera with this is because it's just noisy and fairly aerobic so I just prefer to have a little break doing it. There's my sequence followed by the micro mesh and once that's done that's all I need to do to get it set up and then we'll be ready to uh, replace or put new strings on I should say. I'm going with hybrid nines for this uh, and then we'll set the tremolo. Oh, we'll uh, sorry. We'll, yeah, we'll set the tremolo, and then we'll stretch the strings out, and we'll be ready to go. And this will be able to go out Monday for for Gary. Okay, so see you in a bit. Right, polish done, exhausted, and time to restring, restring and stretch out, and then set the tremolo. Now here's a funny thing, right? I'm making a couple of, well, one, two left-handed guitars, one with tuners and one with a headless unit. But <laughs> this is going to sound really silly. One of the things I don't know is whether I have to get left-handed tuners for a three-a-side guitar. Now, I'm going to have to actually put some tuners back onto the headstock of the guitar I've got there and hold it backwards, hold it left-handed and try and tune it and see if it makes sense or whether it feels like it's back to front because what I don't have is a set of left-handed tuners. Now I feel even saying that I feel like how do you not know that because usually what happens is people send me stuff or buy stuff if they want an upgrade on their guitars or they, if I get a left-hander through, it's usually you know, direct from Toman or something like that, or bought direct from eBay or something. So it's usually whatever the original equipment came on it, which includes left-handed pots. Now, again, I'm not even experienced enough to know if there is such a thing as a left-handed pot or whether actually you wire a pot left-handed by just changing the direction uh, it works. And, and Don't drop off there, you swine. <laughs> uh, in other words, um, reversing its lugs, if you get what I mean. Um, so it's really weird. Uh, so it's uh, and it's one of those simple things which should be simple to anybody. Ah, oil. Uh, it should be simple, but it confuses me every time. Anyway, so I have to do a bit more research because I don't want to obviously put on... I bought, funnily enough, I bought left-handed pots for this guitar and the other one I'm making. Um, and I'm just thinking, do I even need to do that? Or is this some sort of gigantic guitar industry joke? Um, because I actually can't see them working any different. You have to wire them differently, I think. But I could be completely wrong. Anyway, forgive me for my naivety but it's if you're if you're anything like me you will also find it very hard to get your head round that now I think I when when I got some left-handed pots inverted commas they came with you know this company sold them as left-handed pots and I got them and I did a bit of research and it, everything I saw seemed to say 
There's nothing essentially left-handed about them. You just have to wire them. In which case, I couldn't see any reason about the construction why they're in any way left-handed. Which then made me think, why did the company sell them as left-handed? They're just having a joke on people who don't know the difference. Which would be a very hilarious, you know, industry thing like um, telling an, an apprentice to go and ask for a long wait or something, you know. Anyway, honestly don't know the answer to it. So I'm just kind of amused to see. Um, of course, when you look online, can you find, uh, can you find a conclusive answer? No. Uh, the information certainly isn't kicking about ready to just answer a simple question like that. So it's one of the things you have to work out for yourself. So um, what I know is having wired the pot inverted commas back to front, uh, it seemed to work nicely back to front as, it, as intended, the opposite way than I would normally expect. So it rolled that way instead of that way. But that, I'm pretty certain, was because I wired it back to front, inverted commas. Anyway. In which case, it's just a total joke selling left-handed pots. So somebody... Now, this is a classic example of one of those things that people who don't quite know and don't understand feel immediately stupid asking someone. And then when you do ask someone, you get, at best, you either get ridiculed or you get told some gobbledygook that doesn't make any sense, which leaves you feeling even more stupid than when you started, and then you learn nothing, and um, nothing changes. And I think that's a that's one of the really annoying aspects of knowledge sharing, or should I say knowledge not sharing. Um, I'm just tightening these up, they've got a bit loose by the looks of it, so let's just have a, a little feel here. Yeah. I don't want them quite as loose as that. This one's loose. Just get them all sort of consistent tightness. They won't necessarily all stay that way, but because that's what this little tuner or this little screw is on the end for tightening up. Anyway, um, yeah, so it's one of those things I absolutely don't know the answer to. But I'm not so too proud to state that I don't know it. Um, but I, and I, like I said, I also see how very reluctant uh, if I can be and anyone can be to want to ask that question because you either get ridiculed or, or you get told the answer in some sort of incomprehensible way that leaves you no better than when you ask the question. And the worst thing, then you don't want to ask again because you didn't understand because you feel remarkably stupid if you didn't get it the first time I mean you must be right anyway so I'm going to do a bit more research but I don't know the answer what I like I said what I do do seem to know is wiring it the other way around seemed to make it work back to front because the the uh, start point and end point of the sweep is is opposite which kind of makes sense really so if if you know if you find that that's all you have to do to make a pot work as a left-handed pot then Honestly, I, I just think it's outrageous that that piece of information, as simple as that, is not available. And that, this, I mean, I, I wouldn't, it would be hilarious, wouldn't it, if people were actually buying in, suppliers were buying in, inverted commas, left-handed pots, because they didn't know there was no difference. How, how funny would that be? <laughs> and then selling them on to audience instead of saying no there's no such thing you just you take the lugs and you do the opposite you see and that means the start point is there so when you go that direction it's wide open on this and when you come the other way it closes off that means you can use it left-handedly right yay that makes sense doesn't it i think so seems to make sense to me and it seems to have made sense on the guitar i just wired up uh, Anyway, but I don't. But similarly, I don't know. I know there's left and right-handed in, inline tuners, right? And if you if you put them on, then they um, gear the gearing, or they're on the wrong side, or something. But actually, envisaging it and visualizing it is really hard. Um, but I'm, what I can't work out is if that's the case with two sets of three, and if they're because you've got one three for one side and three for the other, and, and can't you just swap them over? 
and that's what I'm thinking but until I put them on and actually have a feel and try it I can't really make any sense of it anyway so right now we have got the strings on hybrids slightly chunkier on the lower strings than on the top ones so I'm going to still try and be a little bit delicate and not run the risk of busting them so I'm giving them a bit of a sort of a, a pull to get them positioned on and then I'm going to go for a, a quick tune Now while you're doing this, or I'm doing this, I'm listening for pings at the nut. Okay, so let's just have a look. I think that is probably, um, for the moment, that's about a bit probably over tightened with three springs, but that's fine. What we'll do is we'll slack it off until the point where, uh, with these gauge of strings on, the bridge lifts up, and then we'll just tighten back up away from that again. Now, what I'm doing is stretching the strings now manually. Um, I keep saying on every video, but I will say it because it's the most one of the most important things I learned is that your tuning stability is almost entirely down to two factors. Equal measure, 50% your nut slots and 50% your stretch, unreleased stretch or slack in your strings. And you take care of both of those, and it's hard for some people to believe it, but you will cure your tuning instability. The guitar will go into tune, stay and play in tune. So that detuning there, So as a result of stretching out slack. So the job you have is the job, your job is to keep stretching it until you can't detune it anymore. And this can sometimes take three or four times of doing this plus some pulls and some string bends and so on but it's amazing how people cling on to the belief that it's something other than the nut slots and the strings and they will you know they will say that it's just some guitars won't stay in tune or the bridge stops it staying in tune or the tuners are stopping it stay in tune or the you know whatever um, and every guitar I've ever had is if you get these two, if you get the nut slots right, and if you get the string stretching right, and you don't bust the high E's while you're doing it, you will get this tuning stability, even when using a tremolo. See how much slack's still coming out? If you don't take this out manually, it will come out when you're playing. Most people know, are familiar with the sound of the, uh, the nut pinging. While the nut pings, your guitar is going to not play or stay in tune. Because that tiny friction holding the string in place um, will, will stop it from returning to pitch. So you, keep, you have to get those nut slots right. Nearly there. Now the action is going to be all over the place right now because 
mainly because I've just put a new set of grub screws in and I've just pushed them in. I haven't checked the action. So at this point in time, um, I would make sure that the action is where I want it. So we get back here and we get ready to do an adjustment. So on the here it's too high. Ah, now that's interesting. Hmm, is it too high? Can I get it any lower? No, I can't. This is as low as it will go. Let's have a look. Fraction over 1.5. I think we're going to have to live with it, I'm afraid, because otherwise we're going to have to shim the neck. And I think it's not, it's not um, worth doing that for the sake of this tiny difference. But maybe if it was mine, I might do. But okay. So now I'm just bringing these other ones up a tiny fraction. So um, this one, uh, if I just put the this one basically sat on the deck, so I can wind the uh, little grub screws all the way in and they're not going to do anything. They're just going to be out of the way. So that's, first of all, that's taken them away from the from Gary's palm, so it's not going to be scratchy and annoying. So now we've got the second one just lifted a tiny bit to um, get it to the right height. And then we'll do the same with this one. Now these have got longer ones because they're going to be slightly higher all round. Um, Okay, so I want about three, uh, three, one and a half there max, a tiny bit less in, the, if anything, and then the same, pretty much the same for this one, um, down and in, kind of. So I want that one to be coming towards the one point two ish or to one point three, then this one has to come up a tiny bit which it is, and this one needs to be these all the way in, but it'll still sit flat on the floor. Oh, now it won't. So we have 1.2, 1.1-ish. So a tiny tweak there, raise that one a little bit. Okay, 1.2-ish, that's a fraction low as well. Tiny adjustments. Yeah. Tiny bit up with this one. Yep, yep, and yep. Okay, so that's good. Now that. Interesting. That's pinging. So a little tiny um, imperfection in there. So I'm going to take my, if I can get to them, <laughs> take me, my what's it, my thing, my jigs, you know the ones, and my aim. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to aim to just clear out that little whatever that is catching in the bottom there where it is. There's, I can't even see it, it's so small, but there's, there's the tiniest of lips or something there, which is, which is catching the string. pushing downwards there and it's showing up that it's right on the front edge so in order to get rid of it I'm going to have to cut right to the front edge which <sighs> runs a very slight risk of lowering it all right but it's almost gone there do a little tiny bit more <sighs> there you go a little tiny detail like that it kept the height almost exactly the same so that's good so now I'm going to just do 
Now that's changed because we've changed the saddle height. Look, we're almost perfectly stable now. Um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take that. Oh, I'm going to hold it up. I'm going to get a screwdriver and I'm going to file out the uh, claw until I see movement. And if I see movement, which I might already have seen, so let's just have a look where it goes. Now, all really I care about right now is this sitting. Um, as flat as it can. Now at the moment it's tilting the tiniest bit forward and I wonder if it's trying to make me think that it's actually lifting up but I don't think it is. I think that might be... Actually, there's only a tiny bit more they can go back. So there's downward play for you in the tremolo. Wrong arm, I know, but we can make it a bit looser. Jeff Beck. So that's hardly any um, downward pitch, courtesy of the strings. But if we put a, if we go back and load it a bit more, we'll probably pull it back a little bit flatter. Um, but it will increase the stiffness of the tremolo to operate. So it's kind of a, a playoff between starting it or having it with absolutely no give at all in the backward direction, which is about there. I mean, you can. What it means is you. you what you really care about is the ability to um, basically put your hand on here and get for virtually no detuning. That's pretty much there. And then once we put the tremolo arm back in a little bit, um, we've got quite easy. See how it's in tune? See, people have the misconception that the tremolo arm puts the guitar out of tune. Well, it does, but it's not. It doesn't cause it to go out of tune. It's the nut slots and the unreleased slack that causes it to go out of tune. The tremolo arm just helps it. Okay, we've got a bit of. Um, we could take a tiny bit of that off. That whatever it's called, that relief thing. If I can find the thing. I'm going to do the last little adjustment here. Tiny, tiny tightening up. So the thing about this is if you don't want to use the tremolo or whichever one you get to fit it, ditch this and this will stay where it is. You won't get any, you won't have to do any action adjustments. And there is a tiny bit of backward movement you could do, but the trade-off is that if you go any further back, you're just tightening the springs up just to, to kind of get that last tiny fraction of stability. I think you've got to, you've got to be, you've got to work really hard to detune that with your palm. I think I would rather go for a compromise where you get a lighter downward touch than locking it all the way back. But if you do want to lock it all the way back, then or you want to get rid of that tiny last bit, just do those it up further, put more load on the block with the springs, and um, what will happen is this will then become harder to push forward. So like I say, I prefer a little bit of a light touch to 
make it work. Okay, so that's pretty much all done. Um, the last thing we want to check is the intonation, and then I'm going to have to go and feed the animals. Feed the animals. We're going to check the intonation as, as is. And so I've got my intonation checker. Me, uh, Cork tuner, it's a very reliable tuner. Um, gonna switch that on. And then remember I said this is a, we're using sound. We're actually not even using the sound when you think about it now, but we're using um, the tuner, therefore sound, to uh, check the length. So we ping on the 12th fret harmonic, tune it so it's in tune, and then fret it, and that's pretty much on the mark. Slightly sharp that one, so we'll take a look. on. Um, in fact, uh, what I'll do is I'll take that back just a tiny bit. We'll change the tuning right now, so we'll just make minor adjustments. Okay, so let's just reproduce that um, stagger slightly back. Hardly any Gonna stop there and take this out. It's a bit, a bit of a, a grungy fit, but it'll do for playing testing out. I just do a, a tighten up here. Um, we will tighten up the 
what they call them, strap buttons. Let's make sure. There's a bit of downward pressure and a bit of doing up to make sure it bites. It's good. Then check this one in the back. A little tiny bit of movement too. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, strap for this is inside, isn't it? No, it didn't. Oh, I'm confused. No, there's the bag. Don't think it came with a strap. Or if it did, it's in the bag. Like I said, got to work quite hard to bend that out of kilter. Okay, so a couple more little tiny things to do. Get the um, thingy back in here. <laughs> it's always a bit of a fiddle, this. There we go. And then get this in. <laughs> tiny, tiny. Nope. Need a finer one than that, please. Yep. That'll do. And to get that in the right hole. Oh, gold. Jump. Now to wear it. <laughs> Will it go in? Will it go in? Is it in the right place? Will it go in? Yeah, what the hell? That's annoying. So that's not going to work. Where's the hole, please? Is it back there? Is it forwards? Who knows? I think I'm just going to have to start again. Which is a right pain because. Right, the hole is forward, so thank you. I forgot. Uh, I'll get some. I've got some spare uh, pick guard screws. We'll put those on the back. Since we're a bit short, where did they go? Did they get put away? They probably got put away, aren't they? Good. Switch that off. Put that away. Right. Chrome pickguard screws. Ow. Chrome pickguard screws. Chrome pickguard screws. Chrome. Ooh, two lots of chrome pickguard screws. I'm lucky, aren't I? Took a few of those out for good measure. Uh huh. Uh huh. Low torque. Um, this has got a few holes in it where this. Covers, a couple of different covers have been put on by the looks of things. So. That's okay. Most importantly, the chip is gone um, and the wear has gone from down here. So that's done and dusted, ready to go. Okay, so I'm going to take these bits of video in and get that um, get them uploaded. No, what I'm going to do is just get them off the disc, I think. And I will catch you soon for another one. Thanks for watching. The setup on Gary's Yamaha Pacifica with the addition of a tusk nut, um, new springs, some new screws, got rid of the uh, chip, got rid of the wear grooves down there, got rid of the uh, horrible saddle sticking into the hands up there, and got a sort of makeshift temporary uh, thingy until such times as Gary may or may not find one to suit. Tremolo arm, I mean, you know, it's, it's workable for now. There we go. Oops. Bash. Alright, see you soon. Thanks a lot.